This is Play by Playcast. Is that faster than a greyhound? The podcast about play by play guys. For play by play guys, I am told a play by play guy. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. Now, here's the host of Play by Play Cast, Todd Bodet. <laughs> Wait, the Motel 6 guy? We'll leave the light on for you. No, Joel Godet. Joe Godet. Joel. Joe. Joel? Joel, with an L. Okay, here's your host, Joel Godet. Don't worry, nobody's listening anyway. <laughs> 99 weeks of play-by-play cast. Thanks, as always, for the download, the stream, the subscription, however you found today's podcast. It is the podcast about play-by-play broadcasters for play-by-play broadcasters, hosted by a play-by-play broadcaster. My name is Joel Gadette. It's a professional development podcast that dives into the tips, tricks, experience, stories, process, and preparations of some of the biggest and best play-by-play announcers in the business. As always, you can find the podcast via social media, at PXPCast on Twitter, I'm at Joel Godet, and my email is jgodett at bsu.edu. Uh, Rich Bokini, formerly known as Rich Brennan from currently Major League Wrestling, formerly WWE, was our guest last week. I uh, hope you enjoyed that one. It was a little bit different than uh, what, we, what we normally do on the podcast. It's not often that, that we have a play-by-play announcer on where one of my questions is, do you prefer to know the outcome of the game before you start? Uh, but that was one of the things we talked about with Rich McKinney last week uh, when it comes to calling professional wrestling. It, it was just a different, uh, it's kind of a different, it's play-by-play, but it's just it's just different. And, and you know, Rich talked about it. You're more uh, uh, an actor who plays a play-by-play guy on television. Uh, so it was kind of neat to, to dive into that world. And we've got a couple uh, interesting guests lined up of that ilk, uh, I think, coming down the pipe here over the next several weeks. Uh, so keep your eyes peeled. Uh, your, your eyes peeled? Your ears peeled? It's a podcast. Uh, we'll, we'll have some interesting things coming your way as we head toward the summer months. Our guest today is former voice of the Pittsburgh Pirates of 33 years, Lanny Frateri. And before we get into the interview with Lanny, uh, one of the things he said, and you'll hear it, uh, really resonated with me in the moment and then really resonated with me this past weekend. And you'll hear Lanny talk about the feeling you should have when you're done with a broadcast, because it should take all of your focus, and it's an an effort. And, like, what we do is fun, but at the end of the day, it is a job, too, and we have a responsibility, and, and it should be exhausting. Like, if you if you're finished doing your job and you have called a three-hour game... It should have taken a toll on you, not necessarily in a bad way, but like you should feel like you've done work. And this past weekend, I broadcast the Mid-American Conference Women's Tennis Championships on ESPN+. Ball State hosted them. Uh, Ball State was in the the first round, got knocked out there, and uh, Buffalo goes on to win. But wound up doing, over the course of three days, five tennis matches, so about six hours a day, you know, 15 hours of tennis uh, uh, over the course of three days. I have broadcast tennis once in my life coming into this week, and it did not go particularly well. Uh, In 2013, I did the Horizon League Tennis Championships, both men's and women's, solo on about a day and a half worth of notice and preparation um, and uh, I, I didn't know anything about tennis then. I still don't know a ton about it now. Didn't have a ton of time to research uh, the teams, although I did talk to all of their head coaches, but I had never been in a, in a tennis environment, uh, and there were a lot of things that threw me for a loop, and it, it just, I, I was not proud of it. Um, one of the things was, in collegiate tennis, it's sometimes very difficult to figure out who has the point because they call their own shots in and out. So sometimes a point lands, they put a finger up in the air, and you're thinking to yourself, Wait, is that, are they pointing to you? Is that your point? Are they putting a finger up to say, no, that was out, that's my point? So it gets confusing. You have to very, very carefully pay attention to the surroundings. And I remembered that from 2013, and we start doing our first broadcast in the semi, in the quarterfinals this past Friday, and there were a couple of points where I couldn't figure it out. And there were a couple of serves where there was a fault. Sometimes there'd be a let. There'd be three consecutive serves without a point being awarded. And I was, and I, I, for about the first five minutes, I'm thinking to myself, here we go 
again. Um, but as the the tournament went along, I wound up, and this is probably not good for my eyes, like staring at the monitor in front of me. I could see the courts, but it was you kind of had to look around some things the way it was set up. It was easier for me to look at the monitor. And I sat there, peering at the monitor. My face was like a foot from the screen. I was not going to miss a ball in or out the rest of that tournament. And I did. There were a couple of times um, where I tried to read body language on things I couldn't tell. And you, you wait a little bit um, to try to hear the referee, the, the chair umpire, say something. Um, and you, you put all the contextual clues together. And there were a couple of times where, like, I'll be honest, I just whiffed. But man, did I, did I feel exhausted uh, at the end of it in a good way. And a lot of that was I'm sitting there thinking about what Lanny was saying about the energy and the focus it really takes to do our job. Um, and it's one thing to sit there and broadcast an event. But there were a couple of times early when I got caught that first match where I said to myself, like, man, like not that I wasn't dialed in. But it's like, man, if I dialed it in even more, I don't think that happens. Um, like, I'm paying attention, but that one got by me. So, all right, well, that's not going to happen anymore. Uh, and it just, like, locked in, honed in. It was it was just, you know, I always say there's, there's always one thing, first and foremost, that sticks with me from every single one of these episodes. And that one happened to work in the immediate, and I think it's going to work in the, in the future as well, uh, that sticks with me. It's just, like... When, when we're done calling games, we should feel tired. It should take a toll on us, not in a bad way, but because we put all of our effort into it. Um, and, like, I, I locked in, and I, I thought the championship match went really well that sent Buffalo to the NCAA tournament and uh, wound up after five days thinking to myself, like, all right, I could do this if somebody asked again, uh, as opposed to the here-goes-nothing mentality <laughs> of uh, of the first couple of minutes when things started last Friday. Uh, so that is one of the topics we will cover with Lanny for Terry. We'll also get into um, a lot of the events that happened over his 33 years as the Pirates broadcaster. We'll talk about We Are Family. We'll talk about uh, where he was when Sid slid. Um, I, I mean, the guy saw a ton of different Pirates teams. To go from We Are Family to, like, the last time Joey Bats played third base consistently before right now for the Gwinnett Stripers, AAA affiliate of the Atlanta Braves. Uh, he's seen a lot. Uh, he saw Bob Knight throw a chair across the assembly hall floor uh, when he was broadcasting on television college basketball. So we'll talk about some of those experiences, but the thing that I think is really cool about this conversation is the detail to which we get into X's and O's of play-by-play. We call this a professional development podcast, and this episode in a lot of ways, more than many of the other ones we've put out, is very much a professional development one this week. Uh, so without further ado, let's get into it with Lanny Fertieri, um, who, by the way, is now a professor at Waynesburg State University in western Pennsylvania in the Pittsburgh area. So if you are a high school student listening to this, this will come up on the pod too, and you want a good place to go for sports casting, and Waynesburg is not on your radar, get an opportunity to work with Lanny Fertieri as a mentor if that's where you uh, wind up collegiately. Uh, we will, again, uh, touch on that, cover a lot of ground here today. But we start in the very early years because Lanny was a guy that was enamored with radio from a very early age and decided this is what he was going to do from a very early age. So as we've had on this converse, on this podcast a, a couple of times, on, on, on these conversations a couple of times, uh, I'm curious what enthralled him from an early age. Why at 8, 9, 10 years old did he love what he heard on the radio so much that he decided then, not that he just loved it, but that he was going to live that for a career? Lanny Terry is our 99th episode guest here on PXP Cast. Well, I, I started thinking about being a baseball announcer since the time I was 12 or 13. I, I listened a great deal Having, uh, having been from Rochester, New York, I, grew, I listened to a guy named Tom Decker who did the Rochester Red Wings back in the uh, 50s. And then I listened a great deal to Mel Allen with the New York Yankees because the Yankee broadcast was on WHAM. So, and I was mesmerized by it. And I, I told my mom and dad, I said, that's what I want to do. 
Um, in ninth grade, I wrote a, a vocational book, a vocational report on broadcasting, on sports announcing. And the more I looked into it, the more I, I thought, well, this this really is a possibility for me. And I was blessed because my parents, where they they went so out of their way to open up every opportunity for me to kind of cultivate. When I, interestingly enough, when I got the pirate's job at 28. Um, a number of reporters said to me, boy, you're awful young to get a major league baseball announcer. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but I've been, I've been practicing for this job and preparing for this job for 15 years. When you got the major league job at 28, uh, what was, what was the challenge that came along with that? Um, because if, I mean, right out the shoot, when you're having people say like, Hey, you're awfully young to get this. Um, is there almost a proving ground to say like, Hey, I do belong here and uh, almost an internal pressure that you put on yourself? Well, there are a couple of challenges that I uh, experienced. First of all, I didn't get hired uh, by the pirates in KDK until February of of, uh, 1976. And so I didn't have any opportunity to spend that winter preparing. And so one of the, one of the frightening aspects of becoming a pirate broadcaster in 1976 was that I, I kept reminding myself that 99% of the people listening to my pirate broadcasts knew more about the pirates than I did. <laughs> um, and so I did not want to take a, um, a, a know-it-all attitude or, or, or insult the intelligence of pirates fans. Um, and, and the other challenge quite obviously was that Milo Hamilton and I followed Bob Prince and Ellie King and, there was there was a good bit of animosity towards us because Bob had been fired, Nelly had been fired, and we replaced them. And and um, and then the third thing that came into play was the fact that I was a very young broadcaster. I still was trying to figure out. I had done enough baseball play by play, but I was still trying to figure it all out in my head. And and um, and 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 because of the challenges. Uh, particularly with, you know, a lot of, I, when I started with the Pirates, I, I would listen to talk shows after the game, and and a large amount of, a good bit of time was spent bad-mouthing Milo and me, and I just had to stop listening because I it really was affecting my, my confidence level. How do you, I mean, I don't want to say how do you, combat that but how do you combat that in a way how that's like the easiest that's like the earliest twitter form isn't it that we all still deal with today well not being as into social media uh, as uh, a lot of my students are and i suspect that you are but you know one of the things i learned about pittsburgh was that and by the way pittsburgh was the perfect place for me to be as a broadcaster because pittsburgh cares a great deal about it's broadcasters and, but Pittsburghers want to know that if you're not from Pittsburgh, you, you have to prove to them that you care about them and that Pittsburgh is not a stepping stone for you, but this is where you want to be. And it does take a period of time. Uh, you have to be in Pittsburgh for a period of time before there's a segment of Pittsburghers and pirates fans that will accept you. And fortunately I was in Pittsburgh a long enough time that that uh, not only was I accepted, but a great number of people you know wrapped their arms around me. How did you uh, acclimate yourself to a new city, to a new job, uh, particularly on short notice when you know you talked about the, the fans know more than you did getting hired in February? Um, what did you do, and how did you get yourself prepped in a very short window uh, to embark on a major league job? Well, I got a, I got, I got a great deal of a, a tremendous advice. Uh, Joe Brown, who was the general manager of the Pirates, told me that I should make sure that I knew a lot about the players and talked about the players so that if I focused on the preparation aspect of broadcasting, and by the way, when I teach at Waynesburg University, uh, one of the things I tell my students, and I strongly believe this, 85% of the success, <clears throat> I'm sorry, 85% of the success of the broadcast is determined before you go on the air. And those broadcasters that do hours and hours of preparation and you meet and you talk to coaches and managers and players, 
then you are you can quickly get up to speed because you know that what players tell you, the stories they tell you, the the, the stories about their families, all that information is is information that, that probably your audience does not know, but you now know, and so you can pick up um, some points in in, in re- reference to that. The other thing was Bob Prince. Even though I was one of the guys who replaced Bob Prince, Bob Prince gave me a tremendous amount of advice, and I was surprised by that. I didn't. You know, I thought to myself, how, how is it that this guy getting fired from this job would care enough about me to, to, to mentor me? And Bob did. And one of the things Bob told me was, in addition to being a voice on the air, you need to go out and meet Pittsburgh. You need to go out and make appearances. And so starting with my first winter of, of my time in Pittsburgh between 1976 and 1977, I started making a tremendous number of appearances. I averaged probably 35 to 40 appearances a winner because I wanted Pittsburghers to get to know me as a person, not just know me as a voice. What did you learn from doing that? Well, I learned a great deal about what what people loved about the Pirates. I, I heard people tell me stories about memories they had from going to Pirates game and and uh, players that they liked and uh, and even what they liked from broadcast, you know, what, what it was about Bob Prince that they liked. And even in some cases, which was tough to swallow, what they didn't like about me. <laughs> so, um, and, and I met a number of people, a good number of people, that were not bashful about telling me how they felt about me. Did that change you at all? Oh, For the did. better? Yeah, there were a number of things in my career as a pirate broadcaster that changed me. Um, um, I'm... <laughs> I'm, I'm not really a very confident person. Um, uh, I mean, I know now uh, that I'm 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 a pretty good broadcaster, and I, I think I was a pretty pretty good baseball announcer. Um, it took me a while to to convince myself of that, um, but uh, you know, it 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 takes a while. Um, you know, I, I made a lot of mistakes early on. I was too statistic oriented early on. I think that's a major problem for a good number of broadcasters, particularly young broadcasters, novices that come into the business. They don't, if they don't do the prep work and talk to players and get stories, then what are they going to use? And so they, they, they find it easy to overdo the stats. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I also found myself, um, you know, one of the problems I felt early on was I, I, listened to Vince Scully a lot and I was so amazed by how good he is or was and um, you know I tried to I tried to follow in his footsteps a little bit and, and I realized that hey Lanny you got to be Lanny you can't be you can't be Vince Scully you can't be Bob Prince you know you can't be Jack Buck you, you've got to be Lanny and and when, once I accepted that uh, mentally it was better for me Tell me a little bit about some of those names, um, because I've read where you, you talked about, particularly when you were a younger broadcaster, guys like Jack Buck, uh, Harry Callis, uh, Vin Scully were really valuable mentors for you, um, which is, for somebody my age, like, crazy to think about, because those are, like, it, it's a very Mount Rushmore of this business, and to, to be exposed to that when you're starting out as a major league broadcaster has got to be incredible. Uh, what was it like to be around those guys and uh, to have them as some kind of a, a mentor relationship as you were, you were finding your feet at that level. You know, um, it was extremely beneficial for me to have an opportunity to, to chat with those, those giants of our business and to ask them questions about how they did things. Um, you know, I, uh, um, I, I very often would say to myself, well, if I had a question about how I should handle things, I would, I would say, what would Scully do? Uh, <laughs> when, when, when people now, you know, there's a good number of people now that are, they don't say RBIs anymore. They say RBI. Um, and there's all kinds of arguments of why RBI is right and RBIs is not anymore. And I say, well, what, what, what does Scully do? You know, how would Scully handle that? And that answered a lot of my questions. Uh, uh, there's another thing that I, uh, I jumped on and, and part of, by the way, understand part of what I did as a pirate broadcaster was based on what 
to a certain extent, what Bob Prince did. Uh, for example, there are some broadcasters in baseball that will do birthdays and anniversaries and also announce when you're on the road, people that are in the ballpark and that are visiting Dodger Stadium or or uh, visiting in San Diego or wherever. And Bob Prince did that. Rosie Rosewell did that. And so I did that. And all of my partners did that. And, and that became part of the pirate tradition of broadcasting. You'd never hear Lindsey Nelson do that in New York. You'd never hear Vin Scully do that in Los Angeles. But it was an accepted part of the broadcast in, in Pittsburgh. So in addition to another thing, too, that was, was a tradition of Pittsburgh, is that Bob Prince, Bob Prince always called a ball that bounced over the fence a book rule double. And he's right about that. It is a book rule double. It is not a ground rule double. When the umpires and the managers meet at home plate, they do not say, <laughs> hey, when the ball bounces over the fence, what is it? Okay? The only, yeah. ground, the only ground rule double that I can think of is when a ball goes into the ivy at Wrigley Field. That's a ground rule double. But it's in the it's in the rule book. But I suspect that there is now that I'm no longer a major league announcer, I probably was Bob Prince and I were probably the only two announcers in baseball that ever called it a book rule double. That's interesting. I've never thought about it that way, and that's very true. <laughs> it's just one of those things you kind of take for granted. Um, you use the phrase, and I actually have it written word for word on my notes here um, before we even started talking. That 85 percent of the broadcast success. Uh, is determined before you go on the air. Uh, and I wanted to dive into that a little bit more with you, too, uh, just from exploring your preparation and what you did uh, to set yourself up for the best success possible before you went on every night. I created, I, I, one early in my tenure, um, Ben Scully and Joe Garagiola were doing um, uh, National Game of the Week in at Three Rivers. And I snuck up to watch them work for about an inning. I had the middle innings off or, or I snuck out. A, a Jim Rooker was doing play-by-play play and the middle innings, and I snuck out for an inning. And I went upstairs to watch. And I saw I saw the guy, the guy that was working with Scully, handing him cards about stats and about notes and things like that. And I said to myself, boy, I wish I had somebody like that to feed me information. And then I came up with the idea of creating a four-by-six card system in which I would put in there pirate home runs, I mean, pirate grand slams, pirate inside the park home runs. Uh, if there was a unique game, uh, you know, for example, we had a game in San Diego where a skunk went across the field uh, and delayed the game for 20 minutes. Uh, I, I created a card for that. When the lights went out in the Olympic Stadium, I created a card for that. And and I had this, I had this purple box with about, 500 four by six cards in it and i would keep adding to it every time and and so that when 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 i thought about a game or my partner said something about a game i would just reach into the four by six card file and i'd pull it out and refresh my memory about the details of it um you know i found over the years that baseball people they'll tell you stories about things that happen and then you go back and check the facts and you find out that they, <laughs> they they fudge the facts and make the story better. Uh, well, I have the four by six cards. And, and by the way, I also tell you this, that uh, Bob Walk, when I worked with Bob, uh, he used to play a game with me. He, he, or, and and I, I, it took me a while to pick it up what he was doing. But every now and then he'd say, well, hey, Letty, uh, remember that game? Remember that game back in uh, St. Louis? Uh, and, and, and he just loved to see me rush to my four by six card file. Uh, and then I'd look over and he'd be smiling at me, you know, like, aha, I got you. You, you know, I, I dragged you into having to go to your, your system. <laughs> so I, 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 um, it, it, it's, I feel very strongly. Uh, I don't, I want to make sure that nobody prepares better than I do. And I tell my students and I, I'm sure of it. If they, and I, and I've witnessed those students that do it and those students that don't, those students that prepare, you know, I currently, I have been announcing high school sports now for nine years. When I left the Pirates, I got hooked up with a company that does high school sports on radio and on the Internet. And so now when I go out and do a high school baseball game and I get 50 bucks for doing it, um, when I was a major league broadcaster, I probably got 50 bucks for each half inning. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but uh, and I was overpaid, by the way. But um, when I go out and do these high school games, uh, I I, I want to make sure that I am so well prepared. I don't want anybody to say, "Hey, Lanny for Terry." did a great job preparing for pirate games, but he doesn't prepare for high school games. And, and how can you expect parents and children or or, or athletes rather, how can you expect them to respect you if you go do a game and you don't check pronunciations? And and for example, when I do high school baseball and softball in Western Pennsylvania, I talk to every player and I can do that because they line up and play catch. Hmm. And I, when's, when's your birthday? Are you a right-handed batter, left-handed batter? Do you play other sports? Um, um, if you're a senior, where are you going to school next year? What's your major going to be? Do you have any famous relatives? I want to gather as much information as I can and talk about those those athletes, and and um, and I owe it to them. How long does that take you? When do you kind of kind of map that out for me? When you get to a, if you're doing a high school game to to get yourself prepped to where a, where you're comfortable. Well, first of all, when I, if, if, let's take, for example, if I'm doing a high school football game on a Friday night. Okay? Um, sometime, maybe, if, if I know on this Friday, I'm going to do a game next Friday. So I can call the athletic director and I get the rosters. And then Monday morning before the game, I will call the head coaches. And I will talk to them about their players. and about I need, I need obviously, for football to create my depth charts. I need starting offense. I need starting defense. I need kickers. I need... Uh, return men, and then I'm asking coaches about their players, uh, seniors, where are they going next year? Now, football, I can't talk to the players individually. There's just not that opportunity. Mm. Ideally, what I'd like to do is go to every team's practice before the game and talk to the players, but it's just not possible for me to do that. So then I get from the coaches the information I need, and then I start putting my depth charts together, and then I then I go back and I gather information about not only the standings of the teams, how many championships have they won, uh, what's their record against this particular team over the last three or four years. And then, as you know, uh, you have to do a memorization process where you have to memorize at least the skill players. You, you know, you need to instinctively know that when you see 16, that's the quarterback, that's Jimmy Smith, and when you see 22, that's the running back, that's, you know, that's uh, Bobby Brown. Um, you have to know that you have to memorize that. And so I spend my Friday mornings just writing down these names and numbers. I just keep writing and writing and writing and writing, hoping that I'll, it'll become second nature to me. So I probably prepare 10 to 11 hours before every high school football game I do. Now with high school basketball, I do the same thing. I talk to the coaches. I get the roster from the athletic coaches. One of the great things about doing high school basketball if, if the varsity plays at 7.30 and you show up at 5.30, the varsity will be there. The home team will be there at 5.30. And so you can talk to every kid, every student, every athlete before the game. Mm-hmm. And then when the varsity, the traveling team, the varsity rides with the JV. And so while the JV is playing, the road team is up in the stands. So you can talk to the athletes. You can you can check pronunciation. You can you know, ask them a little bit about themselves. If you hear it, if you, if you look at a name and, and it's uh, a name that is somewhat familiar and you ask the relationship and, um, and when you see, uh, and this is something that I, I, I caution my students about. If you see a, a, a roster and there is the same last name on the roster, do not, I repeat, do not assume they are brothers. You need to go and find out how they're related. And the reason that's a relative point for me is that when I was growing up, I have an older brother and I have an uncle. And my older brother and my uncle are only one year apart. And every time they played football, the newspaper would, would call them the Fraterry brothers. And they were not. My brother Ron is a nephew of my uncle John. So, and... And again, consider the fact that if you say two players are brothers just because they have the same last name and they don't, um, then you look terribly ignorant. And keep in mind that if you do high school sports and people are listing from those schools, if you get something wrong, they'll know it and and obviously be less respectful of the, of the job that you do. 
And then you've got to walk through the stands with your tail between your legs while they all know it was you that got it wrong <laughs> the next time that you, uh, that you see them, too. Um, yeah, and, and let, me, let me tell you one other thing about when you say next time. I have in my house uh, a file cabinet. And there are three drawers in this file cabinet, and, and one's for baseball, one's for football, and one's for basketball. And I have a file on every team, every team that I have done over the last 10 years. Why? Because I don't want to repeat some of my preparation. Mm. And so when I talk to a coach and I say, Coach, what high school did you go to? What college did you go to? What's your day job? What's your wife's name? Um, how many children do you have? Where are they now? Are they playing sports? Are they, are they, are they older children? Are they live in Pittsburgh? And so when I ask the guy, because I talk about the coaches on the air and I talk about their families. And so then when I, if I, if I ask the coach these questions and then two years later, I'm going to do another game with the same coach. When I call him two years later, I say to him, Hey coach, how's your wife Anita doing? You know, how are you Bobby and Jimmy doing? And they all inevitably say to me, well, how do you remember that? <laughs> well, I, I wrote it down, you know, I have it in my file. So, um, you know, and that impresses the coaches a little bit. And, and also it, it, it makes them realize my commitment to, to doing a good job. Tell me about the prep side on the, on the Major League Baseball side, too, just in terms of um, how you would get to know guys, when you would talk to them, when you would... And, and I, we've had this conversation on this podcast before with baseball guys, but kind of towing that line between having to have a relationship with players and also talking to them for information. And like if you're hanging around at the batting cage where you're just having a conversation or where you're having a conversation to elicit something that you can use on the air um, and how you develop those relationships um, so that it's it's symbiotic and not advantageous. Well, um, that's a significant a question that you're bringing up. One of the realities about following a baseball team is that um, you, you know that when you gather information, um, if you don't use it tonight or if you don't use it tomorrow, you'll use it at some point. And, and particularly when you create a four by six card file, and 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 you're asking players about their families and about their wives and children, and and also a little bit about you know what they're looking for when they're in the batter's box, etc. The thing is that what you have to understand as a broadcaster is that you have to be alert to when's the best time to talk to a player. Uh, one of the frustrating things about doing pregame shows in Major League Baseball is that if you say to yourself at 9 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to interview this particular player, and you, you think all day about what questions you want to ask him, and then you get to the ballpark, and that player, you go up to him, and you say, can you do a pregame show with me? And he said, you know, I can't today. Well, that's frustrating because you've been thinking all day about this. Mm. Um, but you can you can say to yourself, look, if I'm going to gather in, particularly, and I start this in spring training. Spring training is a great time to you know go into the clubhouse and just and look and see who's sitting around with nothing to do. And then say to them, hey, can I, you know, can I steal 10 minutes of your time? I, I, I was never a big bat. I was never a big uh, standing around the batting cage guy. Um, I, I didn't find that that was the best time to talk to players. But there are other situations where you know, a guy sitting in the dugout by himself or, as I said, you go into the clubhouse, a guy sitting on his stool, um, you know, just kind of perusing his, his mail, um, then... I run over and say, but 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 you need to you need to go into a clubhouse and say, you know, to say to yourself, okay, who's who's here that I could could talk to, and if I can't talk to Jack Wilson today, I'll look and see if I can talk to him tomorrow. And and because it, it, you're going to get if you if you try to interview a player and you try to talk to a player and you pick the right time, you'll get more from them. If you talk to them when they're 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 busy in their mind, if they're distracted. If there's a lot of people around them, then then you won't get good stuff from them. Um, I asked uh, Greg Brown actually before uh, before we got on the phone. Uh, I shot Greg an email and I said, "Hey, I'm talking to Lanny. Um, are there things that I should ask him about?" Um, and and, <laughs> and one of the things he talked about was uh, little details. 
um, and this goes back, uh, you know, when you're talking about making sure you get the preparation stuff right, but he was talking about the little details that, I mean, that made you good as, as far as, I mean, even just when you're giving scores, you give your own division score first. Um, but beyond that, I mean, what, what are the details of a broadcast to you um, from a fundamental play-by-play standpoint that you needed to get right, that you, that you thought made your work stand out, that maybe some people leave out? Um, what's important to a, to a play-by-play call, um, bottom line? Well, let, let me tell you this. The two most important, I mentioned earlier about preparation, the two most important aspects for a good broadcast are concentration and timing. Concentration and timing. Um, there's probably a lot of people that don't appreciate the fact that when you do a game, um, you, are, you are focused in for three hours. Uh, and there should be, there should be many opportunities. There should be many times when you leave a broadcast that you are mentally exhausted. Um, I would, I found it that when I would do a game and then go out socially after games, people would say to me, boy, Lanny, you're awfully quiet. And I said, yeah, it's because I've been, been talking for three and a half hours. <laughs> uh, my mind has been focused on the game and been picking up subtle things about the game. And, and, but this timing thing, and that's one of the reasons, and I strongly believe this, uh, Baseball is the most difficult sport to do, more difficult than hockey, more difficult than basketball, more difficult than baseball or than, than, than football, because the, the, the timing of baseball games is not as predictable as the other sports are. And, and to be a good baseball announcer, you have to be able to pick up the rhythm of the game in such a way that you know where everything belongs. And then in, in concert with that, I also found that I, I needed to have, I'm a rule follower. I follow rules. When I do sports, for example, the biggest criticism of play-by-play announcers, without question, the biggest criticism of play-by-play announcers is they don't give the score enough. And I don't understand why that's such a problem. Bob Prince taught me that I should give the score every batter, every 3-2 pitch, every time going to commercial break, every time the score changes, and... If I don't think I've given the score recently, then give it. But if I give the score every batter and every 3-2 pitch, there is no way that anybody can ever say to me that I don't give the score enough. What I teach here at Waynesburg is give the score every whistle in basketball. If you give the score every whistle in basketball, if you give the score every whistle in hockey, there is no way anybody can say you don't give the score enough. So I teach myself rules and I teach my students rules. Other rules, the importance of play-by-play is directly proportional to a team's scoring. Therefore, the closer a team gets to scoring, whether it's in basketball, whether it's in football, whether it's in hockey, or whether it's in baseball, the minute that you, as a good play-by-play announcer, say to yourself, okay, it is first and 10 for Waynesburg on the teal 10-yard line. Waynesburg's 10 yards away from scoring. So nothing, absolutely nothing, is more important than the play-by-play. The play-by-play announcer needs to know that, and the color analyst needs to know that. So he doesn't get in the way and, and possibly ruin the call of the touchdown or in basketball. The color announcer can talk in basketball up to the timeline. But once that ball goes into the four, it goes into the offensive zone, then nothing is more important than the play-by-play. In hockey, it's okay in the neutral zone for the color announcer to talk. It's okay in the defensive zone. But once that puck comes over the blue line into the offensive zone, then the play-by-play announcer has to be really dominant and focus on the play-by-play. Therefore, what I'm saying to you is that when, when I was a pirate broadcaster, I only did promos, I only did birthdays, I only did anniversaries, I only did ancillary stuff, when I was certain that there was not about to be something significant offensively. And by the way, I also set up a rule for myself that I only did birthdays, promos, and the other ancillary stuff when the other team was batting. So that if I got caught, you know, let's say I got caught reading a birthday announcement and the next pitch was a home run. It wouldn't be as bad if it was a visiting team home run as opposed to it was a pirate home run. Because if, if, if stations and if teams use replays of the better moments of a game, 
they're probably 95% most likely to use a play from the from your team and less likely to use. So if you screw up the other team's home run call because you got caught reading a birthday, it's not as big a deal. I'm glad I asked that uh, because I've never heard the time and score every whistle in basketball, and that's actually a really good feather in the cap uh, to, well, and, and to keep let, in the back of my mind. This, yeah, Joel, let me tell you this, okay? Um, and the other reason I teach that rule is that when the whistle blows in basketball, there are times when you don't know why it blew. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to you don't want to say the whistle blew and then start mumbling and stumbling about why the whistle blew. So if you say so, the whistle stops play with three twenty seven left in the second quarter with uh, uh, Waynesburg High School leading uh, West Green. While you're giving the score, you now find out why the whistle blew. And so I tell my students. Whistle blows, score in time, and then you'll find out what. And the other thing, too, about the criticism of announcers when they give the score a lot or don't give the score enough, there are those moments in a game when you need to give the score in such a way that you are basically saying by the tone of your voice, okay, folks, here comes the score, uh, and you drag it out. Like when there's a, for example, hockey, when you're doing a hockey game, if there's, a, if there's an icing call, you know you have probably 15 to 20 seconds before the linesman gets the puck and brings it all the way down the ice. So you make a bigger jump. So with 10, 20 remaining in the second period, the Penguins, three, and the Flyers, nothing. You make a big deal about it to, in a subtle way, say to your listeners, okay, here's the score. Interesting. Um this has been like one of the most like uh, informative breakdowns of play by play that we've done on here. And I'm glad, uh, I'm glad we've, we've, de- <laughs> we've delved into it the way we have. Um, I, I want to ask you some, some moments, uh, some moment memories, if I can, going back on, on your career um, with the pirates in particular and, and some guys that you had the chance to cover. And, and for me growing up with, with how old I am, obviously Barry Bonds was a big part of my kind of teen and early twenties experience in, in watching baseball. And, um, he always had that that public rap of not being a guy that liked to talk to the media. Um, so, as a guy that worked with him earlier on in his career, I was curious what it was like covering Barry Bonds, um, kind of on the come up of his career. Well, I, I got along pretty well with Barry. Uh, you, you you learn as a major league broadcaster that uh, some players some players will give you something, some players won't. Uh, John Milner, one of the stars of the 1979 Pirate Broadcast, a 1979 championship, um, he, he didn't want to be bothered. And so you just said hi to John, and you basically left him alone. Um, uh, Barry, was, Barry was fine with me. If I, if, I, if I really needed something from him, I could go up to him and say, hey, Barry, I, you know, I, I really need in the next couple of days to do a show with you. Can you do it for me? But I also know, for example, when he was with the Giants, he came into town one time, and I saw him. Uh, in in the corridor leading to the locker room. And I said, Barry, would you do me a big favor and do a TV interview with me today? And he said he would. And then I found out later that 20 minutes later, Greg Brown asked him if he'd do a radio interview and he gave, he gave Greg some lip. And so I lucked out that day and and Greg didn't. (laughs) Uh, So, but uh, it's unfortunate that, uh, uh, I know a lot of people in baseball that I respect, Bill Verdon and Jimmy Leland, they both have told me that they think Barry Bonds is the greatest player that they've ever seen. Uh, and there are two people, Bill Verdon and Jim Leland, who I have tremendous respect for. So um, I, I I do think that when people ask me who's the greatest player I've ever seen, I say it's Barry Bonds as well, because I've thought a great deal about what Bill and, and Jim have said. Now keep in mind, um, uh, and back to my point about Pirate fans knowing more than I do about pirate history, or or did know more in 1976. I never saw Clemente play. Mm. Um, field, so, um, but um, you know, Bonds wasn't. You know, I, Barry when he first came to the Pirates, we knew that he his, his dad had said to him, "Hey, look, uh, you're focused on playing baseball." Uh, and by the way, another thing about the Barry Bonds. You remember the famous story about Jimmy Leland and Barry Bonds having a fight in spring training? 
Hmm. And and uh, Barry Bonds apparently had gotten into and had a few words with Bill Verdon. And uh, so Jimmy jumped in to protect his coach. And and, and uh, there were a lot of people in spring training had video of this exchange between Jim Leland and Barry Bonds. And a lot of people uh, had even more respect for Jim Leland after this episode with Barry. What was funny is that, that Jim Leland would always say years later when he was doing a banquet or talking to the media about Barry Bonds and about that incident, Jim Leland said, the only reason I jumped in between Bill Verdon and Barry Bonds was that if I hadn't, Bill Verdon would have killed him. <laughs> so, uh, and Bill Verdon, very strong guy. Bill, you know, Bill Verdon, uh, um, i tell you this story, and I wasn't there for it, but I heard the story that uh, Richie Hemner apparently popped off to the media about something related to Bill Verdon when Bill was manager of the Pirates. And uh, Bill Verdon went out in the locker room in the clubhouse, and Richie Hemner was, was sitting on his stool. And, uh, you know, Bill Verdon said, stand up, I'm going to kick your butt. <laughs> and, and the player next to Richie Hebner said, Richie, don't get up. <laughs> Richie, don't get up. He says, stay right there. So That's, that's sound advice. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't know if I would stand up. That sounds like a bad plan. Um, the, I, I grew up an Atlanta Braves fan, so I know the old axiom, uh, where were you when Sid slid? Um, I, <laughs> I, I, can, I can presume where you were. Um, but what do you remember about that moment? Well, uh, a couple of things for you. Number one, um, and I don't believe in jinxes, by the way. And by the way, I'm one baseball announcer that when there was a no-hitter, I said no-hitter. I do not believe that baseball announcers have any impact on the game. <laughs> and, so, and, and my argument is, is that how can you possibly, how can you possibly call a game and not tell your audience it's a no-hitter? Um, and what you're hoping happens is you're hoping that people that are tuned into a no hitter will call their friends and say, Hey, call, Hey, listen to the broadcast. John Candelari is pitching a no hitter. Um, so, but I'll tell you this, the seventh inning of that game in Atlanta, I called my wife who was back in Pittsburgh and I said, Hey, get ready. We're going to the world series. <laughs> um, and, um, I don't, again, I don't believe in jinxes. So, but take that as you want. Um, you know, one of the things, as a side note, is I never, I never announced a World Series game. Uh, in 1979, we were, we were not allowed to do the World Series. And so every baseball announcer wants to do a World Series game. And I never did. Um, and so 90, 91, 92, those were our chances to, to do a World Series game, and we would have been allowed to do them those years. I also remember how, how, uh, how much of a champion Jim Leland was after that loss in Atlanta. He faced the meeting the media uh, and was, was, was tremendous about, about the fact that that's why we play these games. There's nothing guaranteed in these games. Just because you have the lead in the ninth thing of a ball game doesn't mean that it's automatic and that you win. And that's what, that's why he was uh, involved in sports. That's why he was competitive and he was a true champion. Um, uh, in in dealing with the media and talking about that painful loss in 1992. By the way, I should tell you that, that the thing I'm most proud of about my major league career is my relationship with Jim Leland. Uh, he's a wonderful guy, and he trusted me. He shared tremendous information with me. When we were on the road, I would go to Jim Leland's suite after every game. And so I picked up a lot of valuable information, and much of it he let me use on the broadcast. I have another thing I'm proud of is I am godfather for Jim and Katie Leland's son, Patrick. And I am proud that they asked me to be Patrick's godfather. What were those conversations like post game? (laughs) Well, um, I remember one night we were in New York, we came back from Shea stadium. We're sitting in Jim's, we're sitting in Jim's, uh, um, suite and all his coaches were there and, and they were talking about trading Mike Lavalier. And um, I, and he, Jimmy went around the room and, and was asking some of his coaches what they thought, and he got conflicting reports about it. And he got around to me and he said, what do you think? And I, <laughs> and I said, well, I, I don't think you should trade him. And he said, ah, what the heck do you know? <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, another time I went in, I used, to, I used to do Jimmy Leland's pregame show, 
And um, by the way, one time I walked into his office and I said, uh, I said, Jimmy, you just had a team meeting. What was it about? And he said, Lanny, if I had wanted you to know what the meeting was about, I would have invited you. <laughs> so he, uh, Jimmy Leland, one of the things I love about him is that he, he is, he, you know, he's, he, he's a very blunt individual. I mean, he's not going to, he's not going to sugarcoat it for you. And, uh, I learned to respect that from him. Jim Leland, by the way, you know, he knew that, yeah, and I'm, I, I, I was really impressed by this. Jim Leland felt that if, if, if he needed to talk to a player, he wouldn't call him into his office because if he did that, then the media would say, hey, you called so-and-so into your office. What Jimmy would do is he'd grab a fungo bat and he'd go out in the outfield and he'd go up to a player and he said, hey, last night you screwed up in that play. Uh, you threw to the wrong base, or or you you made a base running blunder. You know what was going on. Uh, so Jim would go out and talk to his players individually, so that he didn't throw up this this flare that something was going on. That's smart. What happened? Uh, what happened in '79 with the World Series? Uh, they they just decided that the the local teams. That was uh, the first time, not, right? Well, I don't remember that. I do know this, <laughs> and, and, and keep in mind, now, 1979, that's the fourth year that I was announcing Pirates baseball with Milo Hamilton, and I guess because not too many people cared about us, <laughs> there was not much of a uh, uh, an uprising that we couldn't do the World Series. The next year, the Phillies were in the World Series, and they couldn't do the World Series, and there was a major uproar about not being able to hear Harry Callis and Richie Ashburn, and so they changed the rule after 1980 so um and not only here's the other thing not only could we not do the 79 world series but they took our booth away from us we couldn't even sit in the same chairs during the world series that we sat in for 81 home games extremely frustrating where'd you take in the world series that year well i had i i I sat i sat on the 400 level of uh, three rivers as a matter of fact in the 79 world series writers from small towns had better seats at the World Series than I did <laughs> because baseball writers ran the press box. And in 1979 World Series, I was supposed to sit in a seat about 25 or 30 rows behind home plate. And I met an usher who was in charge of the football press box at Memorial Stadium. And he said, hey, why don't you come and sit in the football press box? And I, I'm glad I did because there was some real cool weather uh, at the 79 World Series games. <laughs> Last thing, and I'll, I'll let you go because I've been uh, I've taken more of your time than I asked for. Um, actually, I have one random aside at the end, um, but I did want to ask you about um, the chair game uh, when you did basketball on television. Because <laughs> um, I've seen a lot of writing about the fact that you did it. I haven't seen a lot about uh, recollections of it. So I was curious what it's like sitting there um, watching Bob Knight throw a chair across the court and just kind of trying to figure out what you're going to do with that on television. That uh, game was uh, in Indiana, and uh, I have a, a son who at the time was about 16 years old, and I am a student of presidential history. And my son and I visited many presidential homes and grave sites, and I took David with me to that game in Indiana, we flew to Indianapolis and we visited the home of President Benjamin Harrison. So David was with me that night. So David still vividly remembers seeing Bobby throw the chair. Uh, What some people don't remember is that Bobby Knight threw the chair towards the handicapped wheelchair section of the arena. Um, When Bobby Knight came out that day and the game was at four o'clock and it was a beautiful day in Bloomington, Indiana, and when he, when, he, when he came out, he looked like he was ready to go out and play golf. And I said on the air, well, it looks like Coach Knight is going out to play golf today. Yeah. After he threw the chair, my partner, Bill Hoskett, said, you know, it's possible that Bobby Knight's tee time was earlier than we thought it was going to be. <laughs> um, and, and you were very complimentary I, I, of the golf course, too. <laughs> I was, you know, I, I'm amazed at how many people ask me about about that game. One of the other aspects about it is that at that time, uh, Bill Hoskett and I were working for the Big Ten Network, and the guy that was the sports information director or the guy that was in charge of media relations for the Big Ten was producing the broadcast. And when Bobby threw the chair, 
the producer told the director, don't replay that. Don't show that replay. And during a couple commercial breaks, Bill Hoskin and I both got in, uh, both said to the truck on our headsets, hey, you got to show this. I mean, every other, every other TV station in America has this video. So you got to show this. And they finally relented and showed it. But um, uh, those, are, those are some of the memories I have from that day. I'm glad you mentioned the presidential history because that was the last question I wanted to ask you um, because this was the last sentence that Greg Brown told me uh, is he said, make sure to ask Lanny to list all the U.S. presidents in order. <laughs> I, I can do that. I'm, I, I have, by the way, I have only, there's only two things about me that I think are remarkable. <laughs> N- number one, that I can give you all presidents, all the presidents, and, and by the way, let me tell you and your listeners that we refer to, um, um, to Donald Trump as the 43rd president of the United States. Uh, Technically George. true, yeah. Well, but the point is, when somebody says to you, how many presidents have there been? Remember, there have only been 42 because we can't go over Cleveland twice. So if, if you hear a reporter say Donald Trump is the 43rd president of the United States, that is incorrect. He is really the 42nd president. The other thing, by the way, that I'm, I think is quite remarkable about me is that I know all the words to the song You Can Call Me Al by Paul Simon. <laughs> now, unfortunately, I don't get a lot of calling to do either, either of those things. I don't get a lot of people saying to me, Lanny, recite the president, or Lanny, would you sing You Can Call Me Al? <laughs> Somewhere Art Garfunkel is very upset about that. I hope not. <laughs> um, have you ever seen Have you ever seen the video with Chevy Chase and, and Paul Simon for that song? I have not. Oh, uh, it's pretty pretty funny. Should I YouTube that? Is that my Is that my homework here? Yeah, go go to YouTube. <laughs> uh, Chevy Chase, Paul Simon. You can call me Al. Will do, uh, Lanny. Okay. If people want to get in touch, uh, or if they're students of this and they uh, and they want to, heck, if they want to go to Waynesburg, uh, I know you guys do the sports broadcasting camps over the summers too. Uh, how do they check that stuff out? Um. They can contact uh, Waynesburg University about the sports announcing camp. Um, if anybody, by the way, does contact you, uh, don't hesitate giving them my phone number. I have no problem with that whatsoever. Uh, I won't give my phone number on the broadcast. <laughs> it does get reach out to you. But they can reach me by writing to Waynesburg University in Waynesburg, Waynesburg Pennsylvania. Go to the, go to the webpage, um, waynesburg.edu, and uh, you can find out the address for the school. And um, I, I I must tell you that I am convinced that Waynesburg University is one of the top five sports broadcasting schools in America. I know Syracuse is number one. I went to Ithaca College, so I think Ithaca is one of the top five as well. Um, Waynesburg is a tremendous sports broadcasting school, and I hope anybody that is thinking about broadcasting will seriously consider coming and joining us. uh, and, And we're a small school. But we give our students a lot of practical experience, which is vital to the development of a young broadcast. That is Lanny Terry joining us here on PXP Cast. A couple of postscripts. Number one, ground rule double. Not a thing. Not a thing. Never really thought about that. Never thought about it. Book rule double from here on out. All you baseball broadcasters out there. Book rule double. He's not wrong. I think that is 100% correct. Another thing that I think is cool, we didn't really talk about it on the podcast. If you go to LannyCards.com, L-A-N-N-Y Cards.com, uh, you can actually purchase. The man saved every scorecard ever from his 33 years of broadcasting baseball uh, for the Pittsburgh Pirates. You can literally just go order like random scorecards. Like I'm, I'm flipping through right now. 2001. Uh... First game of the Lloyd McClendon era. It's autographed by Jack Wilson. Uh, you, you can you can find just all sorts of Pittsburgh Pirates history. So if you're a broadcast, uh, you know, prep nerd or chart nerd, or you're just a Pirates fan, um, I, this is the Braves fan in me. I just said Marcus Giles. Uh, you can have the scorecard. Brian Giles hits uh, his thousandth career hit. It's career home run number two hundred, July thirtieth, uh, two thousand three against the Padres that you that that's available for sale 
Uh, so you can go to LannyCards.com. It's just kind of neat because you can even I mean, even without purchasing any of them, you can see the the history of things that you see over the course of 33 years as a major league broadcaster when you kind of categorize just individual games uh, in that regard. Uh, John Wayner goes five for five on July 23rd of whatever year this is, 1991. Y- you sure. <laughs> All sorts of things in there. Uh, many thanks to Lanny for Terry, though, for joining us here on this week's episode of the podcast. Next week is episode number 100. There will be balloons, streamers, cake, uh, as Corey tells Sean during the SAT prep course uh, in Boy Meets World. Uh, Mr. Feeney, tell him about the the cake and, and carnival-like atmosphere. Uh, that That is what will follow next week. Or we're just going to have a regular podcast. One or the other. Uh, it's up to you guys. Uh, listener's choice. Until then, uh, we are out of time. So hit it, Marshmallow. This is Play by Playcast. 99 episodes in the books. And we're out.